Like me, you may think that to get hundreds of millions of views on your YouTube shorts, you need crazy complex editing. And if we look at Zach D Film's 3D animations, you would be right. But if we do look a little bit deeper, we can see that he did start out with really simple editing that still got him hundreds of millions of views. To show you truly just how simple the editing is within these videos, let's start by watching this one that got 84 million views. Have you ever wondered why the letter E isn't used to grade? Teachers use A, B, C, D, and F, but they skip simple. E. Why is this? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. You see, back in the day, schools did use the letter E, but in the 1930s, they decided to stop after students and parents thought that it meant excellent. It was quickly replaced with F, because F for failed made more sense. Yeah, wow. That is extremely simple, but clearly so effective. Now, while I do want to learn how to make these crazy 3D animations just like Zach, I think starting with a video that's as simple as this is really important as it allows us to understand that you don't need super complex editing to achieve the goals you want. Now, my goal for this video is to recreate Zach's, the one that got 84 million views as closely as possible using the exact same assets, but my own voiceover. And if you stick around to the end, you'll see if I get close to his style. But through the process of analyzing and re-editing this short, I realized that there's just seven key steps that we need to go through in order to achieve the same results. The first of which is to nail the vibe. So creating the right vibe through your editing is really important. In fact, next level editing is all about getting emotional reactions out of your audience through the editing choices you make. And therefore, if you nail this emotional vibe through just simple edits, this is going to greatly outperform any video with complex edits that don't have that same emotional backbone. Now, if we look at all of Zach's videos, they all achieve the same vibe, a true sense of curiosity. Now, this is largely achieved by the nature of his voiceover, the pacing of it, and his music selection. So the first step I'm gonna take in my video is spacing out my voiceover a bit more than I would usually do. For instance, if we look at Zach's video where he asks the first question within the video, there's quite a bit of a pause after that. Have you ever wondered why the letter E isn't used to grade? Teachers use A, B, C, D, and F, but they skip E. Why is this? Now, when you think about it, this just makes sense. He's just asked a question and he's giving the audience a little bit more time to think about it and answer it themselves within their head. This just sucks you into the video a little bit more than if you had just butted those voiceovers together and floated on really fast. So taking my voiceover, I've spaced it out to match Zach's pauses and it gives me a timeline looking something like this. But then to truly nail the vibe, I'm gonna use this curiosity driving song aptly named Curious Thoughts. But when I actually listen to Zach's video, I notice something else about the music. The song naturally climaxes at the end of the video when he delivers his final point. And there's really three key ways that we can do this. The first of which is we can just grab the end of a song and use that part for the video, lining up the end of that part where it climaxes in the song to the part where it climaxes in the video. The second way is we can actually come into Premiere Pro and just use the Remix tool. So if we just hold down while we're clicking on this little button here, we can come down, select Remix tool, and then we can just drag the length of the music to fit the length of our video. Premiere Pro is then going to automatically cut this up, make it shorter, and make it fit. Sometimes it works great, other times it doesn't. Now for the times where it doesn't, or when you want more manual control, this next technique is what I would do. So for this video, I actually wanna use the start of the song because it starts slowly, gradually in, it sounds really nice. But then I also wanna use the end because it has that natural climax. So I'm just gonna cut a few seconds into the start of the song, then go grab the end of the song and line that up with the end of the video so the climax is happening at the right time. From there, we get into the fiddly part. So we wanna kind of find a point with those two parts of the song where they would naturally flow on from each other. Now, rather than going through trial and error and butting it up against each other, listening back and seeing how it sounds, I actually look at the waveforms of each of these two clips and try and find a point where those waveforms match in terms of height. One technique that really helps here is putting the two tracks on different layers so that way we can visually see how they compare. And actually, if I zoom in here, you can see that the beats of the song aren't exactly matching, meaning the transition between the two clips isn't gonna be smooth. So to fix that, I'm just gonna move the second clip over a few frames so those beat markers match perfectly. And then from there, we'll find a part where the two songs look like they would flow on from each other nicely. And then we can put both of those parts together and then apply a constant gain audio transition to it 
listen to it back and hopefully it sounds smooth. Now, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have to play around with this point until you find something that does work, maybe drag out that constant gain transition a little bit. But once you get it, it's a really cool technique that allows you to customize your songs and fit them to your videos much better. With the pacing of that voiceover fix and some curiosity driving music added in, we now have the backbone, the foundation to our edit. So now it's time to bring words to life, going through the script and finding visuals to represent each section, which is really important considering this is a faceless video. So using some fun research tools, I was able to find all the assets I needed to recreate his video but one. And if you ever wanna find out what asset a YouTuber is using, even equipment, you can use the Google circle to search feature if you have an Android phone and you can find it nine times out of 10 really, really quickly. It's so much fun using this when it actually works. But this also helped me find a lot of Zach's assets really quickly, realizing that he found a lot of these A and B grades on the public domain, meaning he can use them in his video freely, but also that a bunch of this footage was just on free stock footage websites like Pexels. Now, a few of the assets were from paid websites like this 3D letter E I found on Envato, then this grade from a different stock photo website, and then this grade from an entirely different one. But then after a bit of digging, I also found that this old school footage was just on YouTube. And this just shows that Zach and his team go to a bunch of different places to find the assets and resources they need to bring their vision to life. So with all the assets found, I dragged them into my timeline, lined them up with the sections of the video where they belonged, and then adjusted their position and scale a little bit to match Zach's video. But another thing, if we look at Zach's video, there's another super simple technique that he uses to keep things more dynamic, and that's just keyframing a scale and position movement on a lot of these images and clips. So I'm gonna do the same to my clips and my videos, except for this first one, because there's something really important we have to do to it first, which if we don't do, we could be missing out on potentially millions of extra views by just doing a very simple technique. Now, another thing, if we look at these old classroom clips, they don't fill up the screen properly because they're these square formats. And if we scale them up, they're just, low resolution and doesn't look good. But we need them to fit this vertical frame for a YouTube short. So the simple way to achieve this is to duplicate all of these clips and we can do this by just holding down Alt and dragging up to a new layer. Then we're gonna select the lower clip of those two, scale it up so it fills up the frame and then apply a Gaussian blur effect to it dragging that up to around 104%. Now to make these clips a little bit easier to work with later on, we're gonna select both of those two by highlighting them, right clicking and selecting nest. And now you can see the clip and the background move around together, which is really important for the next step, creating smooth moves. Now if we look at the transition Zach uses within these videos, they're really simple. And most of them are just a simple slide in animation. Now the easiest way we can achieve this is just by keyframing the position values of our clips, going to the point where we want it to start, creating a keyframe, going to the beginning of the clip, and then just dragging it off to the side where we want it to come in from. Now to make this a little bit smoother, you can just right click each of those keyframes. For the first one, select ease out, and for the next one, select ease in. So it's going from an ease out to an ease in, making it nice and smooth. And notice Zach doesn't actually use motion blur for these transitions, which I think works a lot better than if he had of. Now, if we do the same movement technique to this clip, however, you're gonna notice that it doesn't work very well. Because we had to scale this up to fit the entire frame, now the video is quite big. And if we do a position keyframe animation, we're gonna have to drag it quite a bit off the screen, meaning it's gonna move in very, very fast and not match the overall vibe to the video. But there is an easy way we can fix this. And all we have to do is just right click the clip and select nest. Now, if I drag the position of this nested sequence around, you'll see that it actually matches the size of the sequence we're working in now, which means we can do that position keyframe animation much, much more efficiently, and it looks really smooth matching all the other clips now. And I'm gonna use this exact same technique for this image here, which again is a little bit too big for the frame. Now, when we look at this 3DE coming into frame, you'll notice there's something really important that Zach and his team does to focus in your attention on it. Because we're working on a white background and the E itself is kind of light, blurring out that background allows us to focus in on that because at this point, the E is very important within the script. And all they do here is just grab a Gaussian blur effect, drag it on the layer below and keyframe that value going from zero to around 220 as it comes into frame. And again, this just allows the audience to focus in on what's important within the video. Simple stuff. Now the only other transition they use within this entire video is just a simple crossfade between these old school clips. Super simple, super smooth, but super effective. And now it's time to amp it up, which entails adding graphics and overlays to the video to bring it to life. But if we look at Zach's video, there's really only two key overlays that he uses throughout the entire thing. Again, 
simple. Now the first of these overlays is just this text, which is a sans serif font with a black stroke applied to it and a simple position keyframe transition coming in from the left. However, notice that this does actually have motion blur to it. So the only other difference here is we're gonna use the transform effect on this layer, use this to keyframe the position coming in from the left, and then just crank up the shutter angle so we get that nice motion blur. And the only other graphic Zach used in this entire video is just this fail stamp. Now, I couldn't find the exact version of this stamp online. So instead, I found this transparent video on Envato Elements drag that in and I actually think this looks a little bit cooler than what Zach did, a little bit more impactful. And the only other little touch up we're gonna do to amp things up is to just add a vignette to that final F grade to just focus in our attention on that F. To do this, I'm gonna nest the clip first so the vignette fits the sequence size. Then I'm gonna head down to the Lumetri color panel, scroll down to vignette, drag the amount all the way down and then play around with these other values. But now it's time to keep it going. And by that, I mean setting it up so we can loop the video so it plays over again once it ends. And this is a great way to get extra views really easily. To do this, we need to make sure that first clip has a little bit of room before we want it to start, kind of like this. We're gonna scale it up and move it around so it's at the right position that we want it to start at. And then we're gonna make a cut where we want that clip to start. Drag that first little bit to the end of the video and then drag the rest of the clip to the start of the video. For that clip at the end, we're gonna make sure that it ends right at the end of that video, and then just simply apply a slide in transition like all the other clips we've used. And now as we play that back, you'll see that it goes from the end of the video straight through to the start of the video really seamlessly. And from here, we can now apply a scale and position keyframe animation to that first clip. But if we had done it before we added in this seamless loop, it wouldn't have worked and wouldn't have flowed nicely. So with that, we now move on to the next step, the subtle touch, which is applying minimal sound effects. And I say minimal because within this entire video, Zach only uses six. Listening back to it, five of which are just simply for when these letter grades come in. Now to match his sounds, I just found this newspaper folding sound effect pack, added in a few of them, and then also this bag fold, lowering down the decibels to around negative 15. So this just makes them subtle in the background, but just enhances it a little bit better. And then literally the only other sound effect he used within this entire video is just this whoosh when the E comes down because that's an important part of the video. And now the sound design is pretty much done. So with that, the only other thing we need to do is say it loud with captions. Now, if we look at Zach's, they're pretty straightforward. Just a sans serif font with a thick black stroke and a dark shadow applied to it. And if we look at the position of them, they're a little bit less than a quarter from the bottom of the screen, but they do have padding on each side of them. Now, this is really important to keep in mind because on different platforms, you're gonna have buttons like like, share, and comment, which are gonna cover up some of those subtitles. So making sure you have a little bit of padding around them is very important. So to achieve the exact same look, I'm just gonna go into the text panel of Premiere Pro, select transcribe, then create captions from that transcription and then select all of those subtitle clips, go into the Essential Graphics panel, change the font to a sans serif font, I'm just gonna use Helvetica, change that to white, add a thick black stroke to it, scroll down for the shadow, crank the opacity of that right up to 100%, and then play around a little bit with these settings. And then just move the position of those down so they're a little bit less than a quarter from the bottom of the screen. Now, the only other thing we need to do is pay close attention to the flow of Zach's subtitles. You know, they're not these really fast, like one word subtitles that are going super, super rapidly. It just would disrupt the entire vibe of the video. Instead, they're around three, four words and they match what he's saying and the pauses that he has within his voiceover. So I'm just gonna go through and adjust my subtitles by cutting them, trimming them, and making sure that they line up with my voiceover correctly and also line up with Zach's video. And with all of that added in, we can now render out the video and see how it looks. Have you ever wondered why the letter E isn't used to grade? Teachers use A, B, C, D, and F, but they skip E. Why is this? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. You see, back in the day, schools did use the letter E. But in the 1930s, they decided to stop after students and parents thought that it meant excellent. It was quickly replaced with F because F for failed made more sense. So I hope that this shows you that to achieve millions and millions of views, you really don't need complex editing, but just a good idea and editing that's executed well. That being said, I am gonna go crazy and try and learn how to create these insane 3D animations from scratch because it just looks like a lot of fun but it also looks like a massive challenge. So make sure you subscribe to see that later on. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Peace, and remember, you're only one video away. Get after it.